Hello guys once again welcome to our YouTube channel Edu Hub and first thing that I have to say is sorry for too late video guys I'm very busy with my study yes I'm studying also and I'm in last year so that I have don't have time that much to make a video but I'm managing and making a video but now all thing is sorted and from today video will come regularly so please don't forget to subscribe our channel and share to your friends and family members for more courses so without wasting time. Let's get started. And guys our new course is data analysis as you know how much important is this course in today's world after completing this course you also apply for job in this category and as you know how much salary we will get in this job is very high he is in a demand in today's time so without wasting time let's start. Data Analysis Part 1 Hey everybody! My name's Travis, and I'd like to welcome you to this course on Data Analysis and Business Intelligence in Microsoft Excel. I have over 12 years of experience using Microsoft Excel to build business intelligence solutions for Fortune 500 companies, and training others to do the same, and I want to help you become an Excel Business Intelligence Pro too. In case you're not familiar with the term, Business intelligence is the art and science of transforming massive amounts of data into meaningful, actionable insights. So how does Excel help us do this? Well, first of all, I truly want to emphasize that what you'll learn in this course is not your granddad's Excel. Instead of standard spreadsheet features, we'll focus on a truly revolutionary set of tools available in Excel 2013 and above that empower you to do industrial strength analytics and business intelligence right in that little spreadsheet application that's always open on your desktop. First up, we'll dive into Power Query, a powerful yet intuitive and easy to use tool for extracting, transforming, and loading, that's ETL for short by the way, data from just about any source you could imagine into Excel. From text files to databases, Wherever the data you want to analyze might be stored, you can use Power Query to pull it into Excel and then transform it however you need to support your analysis. Next, there's an optional section on pivot tables, just in case you're not already familiar with them. Pivot tables are an absolutely crucial component of the Excel business intelligence landscape. Now, once you're a pivot table pro, it's time to explore Power Pivot and the Excel data model which allow you to mash up and analyze multiple data sets into a single pivot table, no VLOOKUPs required. And unlike vanilla Excel, Power Pivot lets you work with up to hundreds of millions of records in a single Excel file. I wasn't kidding when I said these are industrial strength tools. Next, to get the absolute most out of Power Pivot, you'll learn DAX, a powerful formula language for introducing complex calculations into your pivot tables. And since DAX is easy to learn if you already know how to write Excel formulas, we'll go beyond the basics with advanced features like variables, the kind of stuff you associate with so-called real programming languages. Now all the number crunching in the world isn't of much use if we can't make sense of those numbers. That's why I closed the course out with a series of powerful visualization techniques from conditional formatting to charts that can turn your calculations into insights. After all, that's what business intelligence is all about. We'll even explore techniques for building dynamic dashboards in Excel, using slicers and timelines to not only filter our charts, but actually change the metrics we display in them. All backed by the data model's ability to analyze hundreds of millions of rows of data in a single spreadsheet. Clearly, there's a lot of really cool stuff to learn here. So why this course? Well, for one, I use practical, real-world examples and intuitive, common-sense explanations to teach you these concepts in a way that will help you see the connection between Excel's business intelligence tools and the problems you're trying to solve on the job. But just as importantly, I've packed the course with tons of exercises, ranging from straightforward to challenging, that will help you retain and even build on what you've learned. 
So if you want to build professional grade business intelligence solutions right on your desktop, all you need is Microsoft Excel and this course to do it. I look forward to seeing you there. Hey, welcome back. So now that we understand the landscape of Microsoft Excel's business intelligence tools, let's jump right into Power Query, the foundation of Microsoft Excel's BI stack. So what is Power Query? In short, it's a powerful ETL tool. Now ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load, which is what Power Query can do with external data sources in Excel. And while Power Query used to be an add-in before Excel 2016, it's now built right into Excel. It's just another feature you can access from the ribbon like anything else. So we've established that Power Query is an ETL tool, but what does that really mean? What does it really do? So the first step of ETL is extraction. That means Power Query can extract data from a wide range of sources. We're talking text files, comma-separated value files, databases of many kinds, and even other spreadsheets, just to name a few. But extracting the data is just the beginning. Next, Power Query gives us the ability to apply all sorts of transformations to that data, just about anything you can imagine. The point here is to take the kind of messy, raw data that commonly exists in the real world and transform it, prettify it, so to speak, so it meets our particular needs. And then finally, Power Query gives us the ability to load that transformed data into Excel. So now that we know what Power Query is and what it does, how can we get to it? Well, as I've mentioned, Power Query is now a built-in feature in Excel. So we access it through the ribbon just like conditional formatting or pivot tables or any other Excel feature. So first we'll go to our Data tab on the ribbon. And then if we look at all the commands over on the left side of the tab, in the Get and Transform Data section, pretty much any of these will ultimately lead us to Power Query. They're basically just user-friendly shortcuts that will tee up certain configurations of the Power Query editor window for us. So we've talked about extracting, transforming, and loading data, and obviously extracting data is the first step in that process. So that's what we'll tackle first. As our example, we'll use a CSV or comma-separated value file that contains information about real estate sales by a fictional real estate agency. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the comma-separated values format, it's a very, very common format in which raw data is stored in the real world. So to extract that data into Excel from Power Query, we'll click this Get Data button, and now we see a variety of categories of sources from which we can extract data. Files, databases, and then Azure, which is Microsoft's suite of cloud services. Now a CSV file is just that, it's a file, so we'll hover over from file, and now we see a variety of file types that we have the option of extracting data from. Now the first one listed here is actually from workbook, which means just another Excel workbook. For our purposes though, we're pulling from a text or CSV file, so I'll select that option. And now Excel brings up a File Explorer dialog box, and all I have to do at this point is just navigate through my file system until I find the file that I'm trying to import. So here's that file. So we'll click that file to select it, and then just choose Import. Now after waiting just a moment for the data to load, we see that Excel gives us a preview of the data that we will be fetching from that CSV file. Now it's not showing us the entire file here or all the data. It's just going to show us all the columns and then a sample of the first few rows of that data. Of particular importance when you're importing a text file is your choice of delimiter, which is how the columns of data in text files are separated from one another. So since we're dealing with a CSV or comma separated values file, Excel correctly guesses that we want to use a comma as our delimiter. But of course, we have the option to choose a variety of other delimiters. But we're going to stick with comma. And overall, our data looks good. It looks like what I would expect. So now to load this data set into Excel, I will unsurprisingly click the Load button. Now before I do that, take note of this Transform Data button. 
This is the button we click if we're not satisfied with every single aspect of this data as is, and we want to apply some transformations to it before we pull it into Excel. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So for now, I'll just click Load. And then after waiting just a moment, you see that our text file data has been successfully imported into a brand new worksheet in our Excel workbook as a table. Now, if you're not familiar with Excel tables, they're a special structure in Excel that's specifically designed to make working with structured data, the kind of data that comes out of databases, for example, easy and convenient. And they have lots of features that make working with that type of data a more streamlined process. Also note that by default, Excel based the name of our new worksheet after the name of the file that we imported. But obviously that's something we could change if we wanted to. So now that we've imported a simple text file, I also want to demonstrate how to import a type of data that if you work in the world of business intelligence, you just can't avoid. And that's data from a database. Databases, especially relational databases like, for example, Microsoft SQL Server, are absolutely ubiquitous in the world of business intelligence. Chances are, if you're working in a business intelligence, analytics, or data science type role, you're going to encounter data in a relational database at some point and have to work with that data. So next I want to show you how you can pull data directly from a SQL Server table right into Excel using Power Query. So we'll follow the same steps as before. We'll go to our Data tab on the ribbon and then Get Data. But now instead of getting the data from a file, we'll get it from a database and we'll choose from SQL Server Database. Now here we're prompted to enter the name of our database server, and this is something you would have to know in order to connect to your particular database. So I'll just paste that in. And then optionally, I can also specify the name of the database I'm interested in. And I do know that, that's AdventureWorks 2019. And then I'll just click OK. And right away, we get a preview of all the objects in that database that are available for us to fetch into Excel. So let's say just for example, I want to pull in this person.person .person table. All I have to do is click it to select it, and then just take a quick preview of the data to see if it looks like what I expect. And then lastly, just click load, exactly like we did before. And after closing our queries and connections pane once again, we can scroll across to check out the different columns of data that we pulled in and it looks like all of our data was imported successfully. And the great thing about these external data connections that we're establishing is that they're refreshable. So if this table changes periodically, we can always fetch the latest and greatest data just by clicking anywhere inside this table and then clicking the Refresh button right here on our Table Design tab. Now before we go, I want to take this concept of fetching data from a relational database with Power Query to the next level by not just pulling in an entire table, but actually issuing a SQL statement directly to the database via Power Query. Now don't worry if you are not familiar with SQL or not terribly comfortable with SQL, you won't need to understand the syntax you're about to see to appreciate how the process works in Power Query. The bottom line is, it's basically a language we use to interact with databases and fetch subsets of data from those databases according to criteria that we specify. So let's say, for example, here that I didn't want to pull in all the people in this person.person .person table, but instead I only wanted to pull in people with the initials TLC. That is to say, the first letter of their first name is T, the first letter of their middle name is L, and the first letter of their last name is C. So to do that, first we'll go again back to our data tab and then hit our Get Data button once more, and again from database and from SQL Server, and we'll use the same server and the same database. But now instead of clicking OK, we'll click Advanced Options here. Now these advanced options include issuing a custom SQL statement to the database, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So I've already written a SQL statement that pulls in people with those TLC initials in advance, so I'm just going to paste that right in here. And now I can click OK. 
and once again, Power Query is showing me a preview of the data that will be returned, but instead of the 19,000 plus rows that were in that person table, we only see five rows. And if we look at the first, middle, and last names of, of the people in these rows, it looks like their initials are all TLC. So I think our query worked. So now I'll click Load. And there we have it. SQL code embedded right into an Excel report that pulls in custom views of data from our database right into Excel. Now, as we'll see in the coming videos, Power Query has a ton of functionality for transforming the data we're pulling from external sources. But when it comes to transforming data from relational databases, the SQL language is still the undisputed king. So if you know SQL and your data is from an external database, consider this option to embed SQL queries directly into your Power Query connection. Okay, so speaking of those transformations, up next we'll dig into some of the many, many ways you can transform the data you've imported with Power Query. I'll see you then. Welcome back. So now that we know how to get external data into Excel with Power Query, let's dive into what really makes Power Query special. The ability to transform that data in a seemingly infinite number of ways to suit your analytics and business intelligence needs. So I'll start out by re-importing the same file from the last video. And to do that, I'll go to my Data tab and then hit the Get Data button from File from text CSV, and then I'll navigate to my sample data, hit import, and now we see the same preview of the data that we saw in the last video. But now is where we're going to change things up a little bit. Instead of just hitting the load button, we're instead going to click this transform data button. So let's hit that and see what happens. So hitting that button loaded an entirely new interface, which is the Power Query Editor. This is where you're going to spend almost all of your time when you're working with Power Query. Right in the middle of this window, you'll see we have a slightly more elaborate preview of the data that we're importing. And we see not just the columns of the data, but next to each column header, we see a little icon, a little symbol. So the symbol to the left of each column header name indicates the data type that Excel automatically assigned to that column based on the data that it detected in that column. Essentially, this is Excel's educated guess as to what type of data is in each column. The ABC icon stands for text data, 123 stands for numerical data, and so on. Now over on the right, I want to call out this query settings pane. So first, it's important to clarify that each connection we establish to an external data source in Power Query is considered a query. And each of these queries will have properties, one of which is a name. Excel assigned the name Home Sale Data to our query by default because that was the name of the file we imported. But if we wanted to change the name of the query to make it easier to reference later, we could. Now even more important is this list of applied steps that we see right below the name of our query. This is where we're going to see all the steps we take to apply different transformations to our data. Now as you can see, Excel has already applied a couple steps on its own without us having to tell it what to do. The first of these was to promote headers. Now what that means is, Excel correctly guessed that the first row of our data contained column headers. Now Excel insists that the data we pull into Power Query be structured in what's called a tabular way, with data broken out into columns with descriptive column headers and consistent data types in each column. So if the first row of our data isn't column names, Power Query will supply automatically generated column names of its own. But most of the time our data will have column headers, and in this case Excel correctly guessed that it did, and it promoted that first row of our, of our data to be column headers. Now the next applied step it took was to specify data types for each of the columns in our data. And again, Power Query does this based on an educated guess informed by the data that it sees in each column. So it correctly guessed that our city column contains text data, and it also correctly guessed that our customer ID column contains numerical data. 
So Excel has given us a little bit of help already, but that's just the beginning of the transformations that we're going to ultimately want to apply to this data. So the first step that we'll take is to make our column headers more human readable by placing spaces in between the words. So just as an example, our customer first name column header is technically all one word. Now it's very common for data from databases to come out in this format where column headers don't have spaces between the words, but often our end users are more comfortable with the more common pattern of words being separated by spaces. So if I want to change that column header, there's a couple approaches I can take. One is to first select the entire column by actually clicking the column header, and then I can right click, and then in the menu that pops up, choose Rename. I'll point out here that as with so many features in Excel, there are usually multiple ways to access the same feature. And in Power Query, right clicking a column after you've selected it is one of the most common. As you can see, there is a pretty extensive list of actions you can take after you've right clicked a column. But for now, we'll choose Rename. And now I'll just put a space in between the words of that column. Now another more direct approach we can take is to simply double click directly in the cell that has the column header. So for customer last name, if I just double click that, now I can edit it directly. And that's probably the easier way. So I'll go ahead and add spaces between the rest of our column headers that consist of multiple words real quick. And now that we've done that, if you look over at our list of applied steps, you'll see a step has been added called renamed columns. So Power Query is keeping track of the changes that we're making as we're making them so it can play those changes back in the future if we want to apply them to a refreshed or updated version of the source file. Now, as I pointed out previously, Power Query works with structured data the kind that comes from databases, which is also known as tabular data. Tabular data is organized into columns with descriptive column headers and typically also means that the data in each column has a consistent data type, whether that be text, numbers, dates, etc. Now, as I briefly alluded to, Power Query has already taken its best shot at guessing what the data types of our different columns should be. And Power Query is pretty smart and it its guesses made sense for the most part. But sometimes we may have a more specific data type in mind. For example, our asking price and sale price columns are formatted just as standard decimals. When in reality, these are really currency values. These numbers represent money. So our next step will be to change the data type of these columns to be currency. And of course, there are multiple ways to do this. The first is just to click that column header to select the entire column and then right click and then hover over change type. And now we'll simply change that type to currency. And now you can see that the little icon to the left of the column header has changed from a decimal number to a dollar sign, indicating that we've successfully changed the data type. Now to do the same thing for sales price, I'll again select the entire column by clicking the column header. But instead of right clicking, I'm going to click this Transform tab on the ribbon of our Power Query editor. So the Transform tab contains commands that allow us to do just that, to transform the values in one of our columns of data in place. You'll also note that there is an Add Column tab on the same ribbon, which actually contains a lot of the same functionality, the only difference being the commands on the Add Column tab don't change the data in place, but they instead create a brand new column with the transform data. But what we want is to transform the data in place, so we'll go back to our transform tab, and then we'll find where the data type is listed here as decimal number, and just click that and choose currency. And now using very different methods to do the same thing, we've converted both of these columns to a currency data type. Now often, our data has columns that we just don't need, and fortunately Power Query makes it really easy to remove these. Just as an example, we see that we have a square meters column that basically translates the square footage of our houses into square meters. 
Now our fictional real estate agency is located in Kentucky where they don't really dig the metric system. So we're going to go ahead and get rid of that square meters column. So to do that, I could, again, select the column header and then right click and choose remove. Or with that column selected, I could go to the home tab and then click the remove columns button and then choose remove columns. And now our column has disappeared. And if you check our list of applied steps, you'll see our last two transformations listed as well. The one where we change the data types of our two columns and then our last transformation where we removed the square meters column. Now in addition to removing unneeded columns from your data, you can also remove unneeded rows. This can be done through a process called filtering, which if you're familiar with Excel, you've probably already done quite a bit. And in Power Query, it works just the same. So let's say, for example, we're only interested in seeing homes that sold for over $500,000. So in other words, we're basically filtering out homes that sold for $500,000 or less. To do that, I'll just click this little filter button to the right of my sale price column header. And now I have the option to filter out individual values, which obviously isn't practical given the number of distinct sale prices available to us. Or I can hover over this number filters option. And I'm now presented with several options for intelligently filtering the values in this column. So my particular goal is to only keep records that have a sale price greater than $500,000. So I'm going to hover over here and click greater than. And now we're presented with a filter rows dialog box where Power Query has more or less filled in the blanks for us. It says keep rows where sale price is greater than. And now it's just up to us to enter a value. So we'll enter 500,000 and then click OK. And now if we scroll down through our data, we can see all the remaining sale prices are greater than $500,000. And we also see that latest step added to our list of applied steps. Now at this point, we've done all the transformations that I intend to do for this video. So I'm ready to load my transform data into an Excel worksheet. So to do that from the Power Query editor, I wanna click this close and load button on the left side of the ribbon. And while later on, we're going to explore this close and load to option, for now, we'll just choose close and load. All right, now it looks like our data is successfully loaded into a worksheet, but let's just take a quick peek to see if the transformations we applied are actually reflected in the data. So looking at the column headers, it looks like we do have spaces between the words. And then if we scroll down through the sale prices, it looks like they're all at least $500,000. I no longer see our square meters column. So I think I'm satisfied that the transformations we applied are reflected in this data. All right, so up next, we'll take our data transformation skills to the next level by learning to edit the transformations we've already applied. I'll see you then. Welcome back. So just the transformations we've learned so far give us a lot of power to transform raw data in useful ways. But processes like this usually aren't a one-time thing. Instead, you'll often find yourself needing to apply the same series of steps to new versions of your data over and over again. So does this mean we have to rebuild our Power Query process every single time? Heck no. It turns out that the applied steps listed in the Power Query editor work a lot like an Excel macro. But don't worry if you haven't encountered macros before, you don't need them to use Power Query. Basically, Power Query allows you to play these applied steps back anytime, but against refreshed or updated datasets. So as an example, I've pulled up our raw source data file, our CSV file that we've been importing and transforming via Power Query, and I'm now going to delete a record from this file just to see if that change is ultimately reflected in our imported data. So I think I'll delete this sixth row here and then save the file and close it. And now back in Excel, the first thing I wanna do is take note of the number of records in our current transform data set, 162. So now to fetch and transform the latest version of the source data file, 
All I have to do is make sure I've clicked somewhere inside of this table, and then on the Data tab of the ribbon, or on the Table Design Contextual tab, either one, it really doesn't matter, I just click the down arrow under the Refresh button, and hit Refresh. And now if you look at our Queries and Connections pane, you see that only 161 records are loaded. So basically, Excel not only imported the updated data from our CSV file, it also replayed all the transformation steps that we had applied previously all over again. So the bottom line is, once you've built out your import process, you can reuse it over and over again as long as it still transforms the source data how you need it to. But that does raise the question, what if our data, or what we need to do with our data, changes, and we need to change one or more of our transformation steps? Or even worse, what if we simply made a mistake when we created the process in the first place? Fortunately, Power Query makes it super easy to change our applied steps. Let's take a look at a few examples. Now first, we can go back into our Power Query editor anytime by navigating to the Data tab, then clicking the Get Data button again, and then going all the way down to the Launch Power Query Editor button. So now if we click that, we're right back in the Power Query Editor. And Excel even remembers the connection we set up to the external file previously, and all the transformation steps we applied to it, as you can see over in our Query Settings pane on the right. So let's say, for example, that we feel like we made a mistake by deleting the square meters column from our source data. Maybe we want that column back. So to remove that applied step, I'll first select it in the applied steps list. And one thing I want you to note before we actually remove the step is that if I scroll over to the right until we get to our sale price column and then scroll down, it looks like we're now seeing sale prices under $500,000 back in our data. But our next step, filtered rows, was supposed to take care of that. So what's going on here? Basically, by selecting any of these steps over in the list of applied steps, you're effectively time traveling to that particular step in the process. So any changes made by subsequent steps are not reflected in the data you see when you select a given step. So if I go all the way back to the third step, which is where Excel automatically applied data types to our columns, you see that our column headers no longer have spaces in between them. Our sale price and asking price have not been formatted as currency, and none of the other changes that we applied have been made here. So you can always preview what your data looked like at any point in the sequence of transformations you're applying just by selecting a given step. Now in our case, we want to remove the step where we're removing a column, so we'll select that. And then to remove the step, we just click the X to the left. So here, Power Query is very prudently cautioning us that removing a step that has subsequent steps after it could cause our overall process to break. This is because a later step may reference something that is the output of a previous step, so then if you remove that previous step, the later step breaks. But in our case, we know our last step to filter rows doesn't apply to the column we're removing, so we should be good to go. So I'll go ahead and click Delete. And now we see our square meters column is right back in our data. Now if I changed my mind and I wanted to remove that column once more, all I have to do is select the column, choose Remove Columns, and then if I wanted, I could even move this step back to its original position in the sequence of steps. I would just select the step, then right click it, and choose Move Before. And now our sequence of steps is exactly what it was previously. Now in addition to adding and removing steps, we can also edit them in place. For example, let's say we want to change our filter that removes home sales less than $500,000 to be more inclusive, and instead only filter out home sales less than $200,000. Now we could delete our current step and then re-add a modified step, but all that work is not necessary. Instead, we can edit the step in place by selecting it first, and then clicking this little gear icon over to the right. 
And that brings up the same dialog box we used to apply the filter to begin with. So all I have to do is just change this 5 to a 2 so that we're now just keeping rows where the sale price is greater than 200000 and then click OK. And now, scrolling down through our sale prices, we see plenty that are less than 500000 but none that are less than 200000 So it looks like our edited transformation is working. Now in processes with lots of steps, distinguishing one step from another can prove pretty difficult since the names that Power Query gives our steps by default are honestly pretty generic. But fortunately, we can also edit the actual names of these steps to make them easier to interpret and easier to distinguish from one another. So let's say, for example, we wanted to make the name of our removed column step more descriptive. First, I would just select that step and then right click and then choose rename. And then I'll just change the name of that to removed square meters and then just click out of that and now our step has been renamed to something that's more meaningful and gives us more insight into what it actually does and again we could just as easily go through all these other steps and rename them in ways that make their purpose their intention more clear and in general that's a best practice especially as the number of steps in your data transformation process grows you can imagine if you removed multiple columns or changed the data type of multiple columns, suddenly all the versions of change type 1 versus change type 2 would lose their meaning, and it would be harder to figure out which step is doing what, so you could edit them if you need to. Okay, at this point we've pretty much covered the basics of Power Query. Pretty crazy that you can accomplish so much with just a few mouse clicks but there's still so much more that you can do. Up next, we'll take a deep dive into a set of Power Query transformations we can apply to numerical data. Things like sums, counts, and dollar amounts. I'll see you then. Hey, welcome back. So deleting columns, filtering rows, and changing data types can be really useful when tidying up raw data into something manageable and meaningful. But that's often not enough. Quite commonly, we also need to apply transformations to the actual data in those columns in ways beyond something as simple as just changing a data type. One example of this is numerical transformations, like addition or multiplication. In addition to changing the values of a column in place, these kinds of transformations can also add useful new columns to our data set. Say, for example, we want to calculate the amount of money we made on each sale, assuming a 5% commission based on the sale price. So to do this, we would need to use the values in our sale price column as the basis for another calculated or derived column. Basically, we want a brand new column in which each row of data is 5% of the amount in the same row in the sale price column. Now, Power Query actually makes it incredibly easy to do something like this. Your first step, as usual, is to select the column of interest. So we'll select the sale price column by clicking the column header. Now we need to select the column because the values in this column are going to be the basis of our new derived column. Now looking up at our ribbon, we see that we have our transform tab and our add column tab. And if you recall, I said the main difference between the commands on those two tabs is that the commands on the transform tab change data in place whereas the commands on the Add Column tab drop that transformed data into a brand new column. So you've probably guessed at this point we're going to select our Add Column tab. And here we see that our commands are grouped into a few categories. We have General, From Text, From Number, and From Date and Time. Well, we're going to be deriving a column from a numerical value, a number, our sale price. So let's look in the From Number section. Now what we're doing doesn't involve trigonometry or scientific calculations or anything like that. I'd say it's pretty standard to multiply a number by another number, so let's click the Standard button. And here we see all the standard arithmetic operations. Add, multiply, subtract, divide, etc. Now in our case, we're multiplying our sale price values by a number, so we'll choose Multiply. And now we're prompted to enter a number by which we want to multiply each value in the column that's the basis of our calculation, 
the sale prices. So to get 5% of those sale prices, I'll just multiply those values by 0 0.05 and then click OK. And now a new column has been inserted into our data set all the way on the right side called multiplication. Now this is a case where Power Query's naming skills aren't exactly the best, but in its defense it can't read our minds and know what we might want to call this column. So it just names it after the arithmetic operation that we applied. Now obviously we won't want to stick with such a generic name, so we'll rename the column Commission. So I'll just double click the column header and type in Commission. And it would also be more logical if this column was placed directly to the right of the column it's based on, sale price. So I'm actually going to click the column header and then hold down my mouse button so I can drag it over to the left of our sale date column. And there we are, a brand new derived column that we renamed and positioned logically within our data. And if we look over at our list of applied steps, we see that we have a new step for inserted multiplication a new step for renaming the column, and a new step for reordering the column. And while I won't waste your time by making you watch me rename these steps, in the real world the best practice would be to name all of these steps so that they're easy to distinguish from one another in case we want to edit them later. So now that we've performed a numerical calculation to add a new derived column to our data, let's try another one to transform a column of our data in place. So if you look at the values in our asking price column, you'll see that there are two digits after the decimal place, just as with the sale price column. But let's say our marketing folks have decided that having pennies on our asking price just isn't very meaningful and might even seem bizarre to a prospective buyer. So what we would like to do is round those pennies up or down to the nearest dollar. Now we don't need to create a brand new column to do this, we just want to transform these values in place. So instead of selecting the Add Column tab, we'll opt for our Transform tab. And again, we're applying a numerical transformation here. So we'll look at the group of commands in the Number Column section. And right away I see a button for Rounding. So I'll just click that. And we're given the option to round up, round down, or just round. Now I want to round these values to the nearest dollar. So I don't want to necessarily round up or round down. So I'll just choose Round. And now Power Query just asks us how many decimal places we want to round to. And because I don't want to see anything after the decimal place, I'll just choose 0 and then click OK. And there we are. Our asking prices are still formatted as currency, but now all of those pesky penny values have been rounded up or down to the nearest dollar. Now lastly, I want to look at adding a new column to our data that isn't based on any columns in our existing data and isn't based on a calculation. So you might be asking, how is this new column numerical in nature? Well, what I want to add is what's known as an index column. Now an index column has a number that uniquely identifies each row in our data set. Now depending on your background with databases or structured data, that may or may not make a lot of sense to you right now. But take my word for it, that when it comes to the kind of data you'll deal with in the realm of analytics and especially business intelligence, having a field with values that uniquely identify every row in a data set is crucial. And the typical convention for these types of columns is that their values are a sequence of numbers typically from one to the number of rows in the data set. And Power Query actually makes it super easy to add a column like this to our data. So since we're adding a column, we'll naturally click our Add Column tab, and right away, almost directly under the Add Column tab, I see a button for Index Column. So I'll click that. And by default, Power Query generated a sequence of numbers starting from zero all the way to one less than the number of rows in our data set, which is almost what we wanted, but not quite. We actually want our sequence to begin with the number one. So we could delete this column and then add a new index starting with the number one. But if you watched the last video, you probably know at this point that there's a better way, and that's to edit the step in place. So with our added index step selected in our list of applied steps, we'll click the little gear icon, and now we're presented with a dialog box that lets us specify the starting index. Now Power Query chose zero for us by default, but we'll change that to one, 
and then the default increment, which is the number by which each value in the index column increases from row to row, is 1. And that makes sense 99.9% .9 of the time for index columns, so we'll leave that as is. So now I'll click OK. And now with just a few clicks, we've generated a sequential index column for our data set. And now the last step will be to just move this column in front of all the other columns, which is pretty conventional when it comes to index type columns. So I'll click it and then just drag until I'm all the way at the beginning of our data set. And then I'll let go of my mouse button, and it looks like we're good to go. All right. So now that we've seen how to apply transformations to numerical data, let's turn our attention to perhaps the most common variety of data of all, text data, like the names of people or things. That's up next. I'll see you then. Welcome back. So the next type of data transformation we'll tackle is text transformations, which apply to non-numeric and non-date values, like the names of people, places, and things. Let's dive right in. So one very common scenario when working with real-world data that requires a type of text transformation is dealing with misspelled text data or inconsistencies with how things are spelled. As an example, if we look at our city names in our city column, the name of Louisville, Kentucky is misspelled as Louisville. Incidentally, the name of Louisville, Kentucky is often also mispronounced as Louisville. And since these types of inconsistencies in text data are such a common issue, Power Query, of course, has a built-in feature to address it quickly and easily. So to correct this misspelling, we'll first select the column as usual. And then since we're not creating a new column, but simply transforming the values in our selected column in place, we'll stay on the Transform tab. And then if we look at the Any Column section of the ribbon, we'll see that there is a Replace Values button. So I'll go ahead and click that. And this is pretty straightforward, especially if you've ever used find and replace. We basically just need to type the value we want to replace, which is Louisville, and then the value we want to replace that with, which is the correct spelling of Louisville. And then clicking OK, all of those misspellings have now been corrected. Now another common text transformation is merging text data. A very common example of this is when our data has names that are split up into first and last name and sometimes even middle name that we later want to combine back into a single value that has the person's first and last name just separated by a space. Again, because this is a very common transformation need, Power Query has a feature built right in that does this in a couple of mouse clicks. So first we need to select the two columns we want to merge and keep in mind it actually could be more than two, but in our particular case we're just merging first name and last name. So we'll select the first column, and then to select the second column, we can either hold down our shift key or our control key, and then just click that second column header. And now, with both columns selected, and still on the Transform tab of our ribbon, we'll click the Merge Columns button in the Text Column section. And like so many other dialog boxes in Power Query, it's really very straightforward. First, it asks us to provide a separator, which is just the text that will be positioned between our two values. And in our case, we just want the first name, then a space, then the last name. So our separator should obviously be a space. So if we look down the list here, we do see a space. And then we're also given the option to provide a name for the new column. And I'll just call it customer name and then click OK. And as you can see, our customers' first names and last names have now been combined into single values just separated by a space. Now in the same way that we can combine data from separate columns, we can also split data from a single column into separate columns. If we scroll over to look at our city column, we can see that it actually contains two pieces of information, which is kind of a no-no for tabular data. Tabular data sets are supposed to be organized into columns, which each contain a single type of information about the overall subject of the table. But in this case, our city column contains both the city and the state, 
of our individual properties that have been sold. So what we need to do is split city and state into their own separate columns. The most common way to perform a transformation like this is to identify a delimiter or a particular character of text that separates the values that we want to drop in one column from the values we want to drop in another column. Now looking at our values here, we see that there's a comma in between the city and the state that we can use as that delimiter. But if we look a little more carefully, we'll see that it's not just a comma. There's actually a comma and a space. So it won't be quite enough to just use a comma as our delimiter. Now let's go ahead and see how we can split these values on that comma and space. So first I'll select the city column. And now in the text column section of the transform tab, I'll click the split column button because that's exactly what we're trying to do. Now we've already identified that we have a delimiter that we can split this column on. So we'll choose the by delimiter option. And by default, Power Query is guessing that we'll want to use a comma as our delimiter. But again, because our values are separated by a comma and a space, we'll need to use a custom delimiter. So let's click this drop down list and then roll down to custom. And now we can actually type in the delimiter we want to use, which is just a comma and then a space. Now we don't need to change the other defaults. For example, it's fine to split at each occurrence of the delimiter because we only expect to have one comma per value. Now if there were the possibility of having multiple commas in our individual text values, we might need to be more strategic in terms of whether we split at the leftmost, rightmost, or each occurrence of the delimiter. But for our purpose here, each occurrence will work fine, so we'll go ahead and click OK. And we've now successfully split our city and state values into their own columns. So now, of course, I just need to rename our columns. And it looks like we're good to go. Now, the last transformation I want to introduce you to is more of a formatting or visual enhancement. So if we go back to our customer names, we'll see that they're all in lowercase, which is somewhat unconventional for people's names. Typically, people's names have the first letter of each name capitalized with the remaining letters lowercase. So what we'd like to do here is transform these names to meet that standard. So first I'll click the customer name column, and then in the text column section of the transform tab, I'll click format. And here we have a number of options for applying visual type transformations to text data. We could optionally uppercase every letter of our names, but what we're looking for is basically capitalizing each word, making the first letter of each name uppercase. So we'll choose that. And I think that looks a lot better. Now I do want to emphasize that there are a lot more text transformation methods than I've shown you here. My goal is not to show you every single transformation method that Power Query makes available to us. My goal is to show you the ones that you'll use most of the time and get you familiar enough with the structure and layout of the menus that you can find the ones that you need that maybe you don't already have experience with. Okay, up next we'll round out our survey of data transformations by exploring Power Query's features for working with date and time data. I'll see you then. Welcome back. Now that we've explored Power Query's data transformations for numerical and text data, it's time to finish our coverage of the big three data types by diving into date data. So date and time transformations in Power Query are most commonly used to extract components from a date. For example, the day of the week, the month, the year, etc. Pretty simple stuff really. For example, we can quickly add a new column to our data set that lists the name of the day of the week alongside each sale date. So we've already got our sale date column selected and we know we want to add a new column so we've got our add column tab selected. So now we'll look in the from date and time section of that tab and then click the date button. And here we see a lot of options for how we can parse individual components out from a date. So the component we have in mind is the name of the day of the week. So we'll roll down to day and hover over that. And we see that the last option is name of day. So we'll select that. And then if we scroll over to the right, 
we see we now have the name of each day in our sale date column. Now this is the kind of transformation that, were you to try to accomplish it with conventional Excel, would require a formula or function. Whereas with Power Query, you're able to accomplish it with just a few mouse clicks. Now that in and of itself is cool enough, but a more interesting application of date transformations is building what's known as a calendar table. A calendar table contains a series of sequential dates, typically encompassing some time period of interest, with one row per date. Now on its own, a list of dates isn't terribly interesting. But where calendar tables contribute their value is with additional columns that feature either components of the dates, like month or year, or information about them. For example, whether a particular date is considered a holiday or not. Having all this information in one place gives us a one-stop shop for everything we might want to know about a particular date. And instead of having to re-derive all of this information in a hundred separate places, as is so often the case, we can get it for free just by linking to our calendar table. Now as an aside, we'll talk a lot more about connecting different tables, as well as interesting applications of calendar tables in particular later in the course. So to create our calendar table, first we need a list of dates. Now it is possible to generate such a list using the M programming language, which we have actually been writing this entire time without even knowing it. If you look up at the bar directly above our data preview, which looks very much like the formula bar in standard Excel, you see some very strange looking code that corresponds with the latest transformation step we applied. That's the M programming language, and Power Query has been writing it for us every time we apply a data transformation. But the thing is, learning M is a challenging and time-consuming enterprise on its own, and 99% of what you'd ever need to do in Power Query you can accomplish with graphical tools like we've been doing so far. So for now, we'll stick with the easy way, because I want you to be able to easily remember how to do this. Now for our purposes, we're going to source that list of dates from a list in an Excel file, which you can see here. Now I was able to generate this very quickly just using Excel's autofill feature. Also note that the dates are formatted as a table, which is Excel's built-in feature for dealing with structured database type data. Now Power Query is smart enough to recognize ranges of data in Excel sheets even if you don't format them as tables most of the time, but it's still a best practice to format any data in an Excel worksheet that you intend to pull into Power Query as a table. So back to our Power Query editor. Now we're going to import that table into Power Query. Now thus far we've only been working with one external data source at a time, and we can see that external data source over on the left side of our screen under the Queries heading but you can actually work with multiple different data sources in a single Power Query editor, as we're about to see. So if we want to pull in a brand new external data source and form a brand new query or connection, first we'll go to the Home tab, and then over on the right, in the New Query section, we'll click New Source. And then because we're pulling our data in from a file, we'll hover over File, and then Excel Workbook. And then it's just a matter of navigating to our Excel file and then selecting it and choosing Import. And Power Query is now automatically detecting all the objects in that workbook available for import. Now we formatted our dates as a table, so we'll choose Table 1. And if we look at our preview, we see that it looks like exactly what we want to pull into Power Query, just a list of dates. So we'll click OK. And now our new connection, our new external data source, is selected by default, so we have different data in our data preview section, and we also have a different set of applied steps over on our query settings pane. Now first of all, I don't really like that name of our data connection, Table 1, so I'm going to rename it Dates. And now that we have our list of dates in Power Query, I want to scroll to the bottom of that list just to call out one additional aspect of building calendar tables. So where I am right now, it is August of 2021. But if we roll down to the bottom of our table, we see that I have dates going all the way out to the end of 2021. 
It's actually very common for calendar tables to do this because we don't want to have to update our source file constantly. We don't want to have to add a new date to that file every day and then re-import it. So there's really no harm in just extending that list of dates far out into the future so we only have to do very, very periodic updates to our data source. So now that we have our list of dates in place, it's really just a matter of adding columns that parse out information from each of those dates. So I'll start by adding the name of the weekday, just like we did in our home sale data set. So I'll go to the Add Column tab, and then hit the Date button, and then go down to Day, and then choose Name of Day. And next I'll add the week of the year. So again, date button, and now I'll hover over week, and then choose week of year. And while I could change these column names, I actually am okay with the column names that Power Query is choosing by default. So next I'll parse out the name of the month for each date in our dates column. So again, I'll hit the date button, then I'll hover over month, and then I'll choose name of month. And then I can do quarter, and I can also do year. And one more interesting piece of information you can parse out of a date using Power Query very easily that's somewhat more difficult to get to with conventional Excel is the first or last day of the month associated with a given date. So if I go back to our dates column and select it, and then hit our date button again, and then roll back over month, I can either parse out the start of the month or the end of the month. So I'll choose start of month. And now we have a column containing the first day of the month for each of the dates in our calendar table. Now obviously I could keep adding more and more derived columns like this for days, pardon the pun, but I think you probably get the point. The idea here is that we will have for each date in our calendar table, all the attributes of that date that people might be interested in. So that instead of people having to rederive those attributes with formulas and functions, they can just tie right into our calendar table and get them with almost no effort. All right, up next, we're going to switch gears a little bit and take a look at how you can apply conditional if-then type logic to your data transformations. I'll see you then. Hey, welcome back. So an extremely common need when working with data is to apply conditional logic to that data. If you've worked with if statements in Excel or case statements in SQL, this concept will be extremely familiar to you. If not, the idea is basically to apply if-then type logic to generate new data based on the existing data in our data set. One common scenario is to create a 1-0 flag in our data. That is to say, a derived column that holds a 1 for records where the value in some other column meets some criteria, and a 0 otherwise. The 1-0 composition of such a column allows it to easily be used in downstream reporting and analytics, either by summing the 1s or averaging the 1s and zeros to get a percentage. Let's say, for example, we want to flag any home sales in our data set that were a million dollars or greater. The logical condition in this case is essentially if home sale price is greater than or equal to a million dollars, then one, else zero. Pretty straightforward, right? And Power Query makes it equally straightforward to implement. So let's dive right into how we would build this conditional column with Power Query. Now first, because we're going to add a new column, I'll click my Add Column tab. And now right under the name of that tab, we see a button for Conditional Column. That sounds like what we want, so let's go ahead and click that. And just like all of the other Power Query dialog boxes we've seen, this is super intuitive. It kind of walks us through the entire process step by step. First, it asks us to enter a name for our new column, and I'll call it High Value Sale. And now we have a template for building out our conditional expression. And it's really just a matter of filling in the blanks from left to right. So we'll say if, and then our column name will be sale price. 
Now for our operator, we don't want equals. We want our logical operator to be greater than or equal to because we want to test each of the values in our sale price column to see if it's greater than or equal to a million dollars. So I'll click this drop down, and sure enough, one of the options is greater than or equal to. And then my value is just a million, which I can type in. And then finally, I just need to fill in the value that I want to return in my derived column if my condition is met, which is a one. Now down here at the bottom, we have what's called the else clause. You can think of this as kind of the catch-all. If our logical condition wasn't met, here's where we specify the alternative value that should populate in our new column. So that basically means if our sale price isn't greater than or equal to a million, what do we want to return? And in our case, that's zero. So it looks like we filled out everything we need to, so I'll go ahead and click OK. And now we have a new column called High Value Sale, and we already see mostly zeros, but a few ones. And if we just look at that very first record with a one and highlight that row that it belongs to, sure enough, that sale price was over a million, so it looks like our conditional logic is working just fine. Now another common use case for conditional columns is to segment data in one of our columns into different categories, or buckets, so to speak. As an example, what if we wanted to classify the properties in our data as large, medium, or small, based on their acreage? So for this column, our acreage column would be the basis of our calculation. So for our purposes, we'll define large as five acres or greater, medium as greater than or equal to half an acre, and small as less than half an acre. So once again, we'll hit the conditional column button on the add column tab and we'll call our new column property size category and our first if condition will test to see if our acreage column is greater than or equal to five greater than or equal to five acres if so we want to return the text string large now here's where things get a little bit more complicated than our last example. We can't just return a single other value for all the rows that didn't meet our first condition, because we actually have two more buckets that we want to potentially place those rows into. Basically, we need to be able to apply another logical test before we get to that else condition. And that's exactly what this add clause button is for. So if we click this, now we have the opportunity to define another logical test that will be applied if the logical condition in the first test wasn't met. So again, we'll say acreage and greater than or equal to 0 0.5 or a half. And in this case, we'll categorize that property as medium sized. And then finally, if neither of those conditions are met, we'll default to the else value, which will be small. Now just to clarify, in order for this else condition to be reached, that means that neither of our logical conditions in the first two steps were met. So that means first, our acreage isn't greater than or equal to five acres, and second, it's also not greater than or equal to 0 0.5. So by default, it must be less than 0 0.5. So now I'll click OK. And just so we can see the values in this column side by side with the acreage column, I'm going to move it over a little bit so it's adjacent to the acreage column. And now just scanning through the values in some rows, it looks like our properties with an acreage less than 0 0.5 are categorized as small. And then our properties with acreage between 0 0.5 acres and 5 acres are categorized as medium and then all the other properties are categorized as large. Now obviously the logic we used to build this column wasn't terribly complex. We only had two logical conditions. But you can really add as many as you need to classify your data into as many different categories as you need. Okay, up next we're going to shift gears once again and look at how to combine or merge columns from different tables together in a single data set. I'll see you then. Welcome back. So now that we've gotten the hang of applying transformations to a single data set, 
it's time to explore some methods for combining multiple datasets into one. The first method we'll look at is called merging. Merging combines columns from two different datasets, effectively making the resulting combined dataset wider, so to speak. Merging requires that the individual rows of each respective dataset be associated or tied together in some way. That's how we're able to pull the values and columns from both datasets together in the same row. This is done using a field that each dataset has in common, often some kind of ID, but also quite commonly a date or even a name. Now, if this sounds anything like a VLOOKUP function to you, you're right on. It basically is, albeit a more powerful one, with far more options for customization. And in fact, our example is going to demonstrate how merge queries in Power Query can be a superior alternative to VLOOKUP, especially when you want to pull in more than one field from your second dataset. So the first step in our example is going to be to pull in the second dataset, which has data that we're trying to combine with our main home sale dataset right here. Now, if we actually close out of our Power Query editor, we'll see that our workbook has a new tab called Customer Data. Now, this Customer Data worksheet contains information, not surprisingly, about our customers, more information that was contained in our master dataset. For example, for each customer ID, we have the customer's email, their phone number, their age, and their income. Now, if we go back to our primary home sale dataset, we see that we do have a customer ID column and then a customer name, but nothing else. So our goal will be to pull in those additional fields about customers into our home sale data set. Now the key here, literally and figuratively, is this customer ID column. That's how we're going to associate individual rows between these data sets with each other. So take, for example, the first customer listed in our home sale data set with customer ID 208. If we go over to our customer data worksheet, we find on row eight, the same customer ID. So in our final output, these values for this particular customer, this email address, this phone number, this age, this income, will be added on the same row as that same customer ID in our master data set. So now that we understand what we're trying to do, let's go back into the Power Query editor and merge these two data sets together. So to get back into Power Query, I'll again go to Get Data, and then Launch Power Query Editor. And now to be able to work with my customer's data set in the Power Query Editor, I'm going to have to add it as a query. Now up to this point, we've been using Power Query to access external data sources, data that lives outside of the workbook we're currently in. But you can also build queries against data sets that live right here in the very same workbook. And we do that exactly how we would connect to an external data source. At the top right of the Home tab, I'll click the New Source button, and then hover over File, and then Excel Workbook. And then we just navigate to wherever in our file system our current Excel Workbook is located, and then we select that workbook and click Import. And it so happens that our customer data is stored in a table named customer underscore data. So we'll select that object and then take a quick look at the preview of the data, which looks good. So it looks like we can click OK. And now we have our customer data available to work with in the same way that we've been working with our home sale data set. Now to merge these together, my first step will be to select my main data set, the one that I'm merging this data into, and that's obviously our home sale data set. And now, still in the Home tab, I'll hit the Merge Queries button. And here, we'll have to specify the two data sets we want to merge together, and then tell Power Query how we're going to merge those data sets. So because we already had selected our home sale data set, that one's already appearing in the dialog box. So now we have to specify the other data set that we want to merge into our home sale data set. And that's obviously our customer data set. So to specify that, I'll just click this drop down box and then choose customer data. Now the next step 
is to tell Power Query the column that these data sets have in common, which is what we're going to use to link them together row by row so we can take the values in all the columns from both data sets for a particular ID and then combine them on a single line or row in our merged data set. So obviously that column is customer ID, so I'll select that for our home sale data set, and then I'll also select that for our customer data set. Next, we need to specify the type of join being used. This is the method by which Power Query is going to tie these two data sets together row by row. Now the default kind, which is the most common and which functions the most like VLOOKUP, is a left outer join. Now if you're familiar with SQL at all, this works exactly like a left join in SQL. Basically, our output is going to contain all the rows from our first data set, and then any rows from our second data set where there was a match on that customer ID field. But if there was a customer ID in our main data set that didn't exist in our customer data set, we're just going to see blank or null values in the columns we're pulling in from our customer data. And if you look at the very bottom of the dialog box, Power Query has already identified that our selection matches 160 of 161 rows from the first table. Now that means that out of 161 customer IDs in our home sale data set, there were 160 matches found in our customer data set. So there's one missing. So in a second, we're going to see how that looks in our output. So let's go ahead and click OK. And now we have this rather bizarre column called customer data that has a bunch of values that say table. So what does this mean? Well, by default, Power Query isn't going to automatically pull in all columns from that second data set. It actually lets us cherry pick which ones we want to keep. So to see that list of columns that's available for us to pull in, all we have to do is click this little button to the right of the column header, and now we see a list of all the columns from that customer data set. So we already have customer ID in our home sale data set, and we know it's going to be the same on any given row because that's how we were able to pull in the customer data to begin with. So we'll uncheck that, but I think we'll go ahead and keep these other four. And then we can click OK. And now if we scroll to the right, we see that we've pulled in the email field, the phone number, the age, and the income. Now contrast this with VLOOKUP, which, while it does something similar, requires you to write a column full of VLOOKUP formulas for every single column of data you want to pull in from your secondary data set. Yuck. But what about that ID from our home sale data set that was missing from our customer data set? Well, if we scroll down through our data, all the way down in this last row, we see the word NULL in all four columns that we pulled in from that customer data set. But if we scroll across to the left, we have normal data values from our main home sale data set. So this is how that left outer join we chose handles cases where the value we're using to tie the two data sets together exists in the main data set, but doesn't exist in the secondary data set. Now there's another way to handle this case, which is called an inner join. Now with the inner join, if a match isn't found in the secondary data set, the row won't show up at all. So the only difference between what we did here and the inner join is that this row, this last row that has nulls from our customer data and values in our home sale data would not be here at all because there was no match in the customer data set. And just to prove that to you, I'll actually modify our merged query step by selecting it and then hitting our little gear icon here. And now instead of choosing a left outer join, I'll choose an inner join, which, as Power Query says, means only matching rows. And then before I click OK, take note of the fact that our data set currently has 161 rows, but we now know that we only have 160 matches out of those 161 rows. So if I click OK, now we see that we only have 160 rows. And then to see our columns from the customer data set expanded, we just need to select the next step in the process, which we already performed the last go around. So now scrolling across, if we go all the way down to the bottom of our data set, we see that that row of data that had nulls from our customer data set is gone. 
and with it is the row of data from our home sale data set which had the customer ID that was missing from our customer data set. So now you might be wondering which one of these techniques should you use? From my experience the vast majority of the time the left outer join is what you'll want because normally you're perfectly content to pull in whatever matches happen to exist from a secondary data set but you don't want to lose visibility into any of the rows in your primary data set. But if your situation does call for only returning rows where there's a match on both sides of that join, then inner join is what you'll want to opt for. Now before we move on, a quick word of caution. With the data modeling tools Excel now puts at our disposal, merging data sets in the way we've just seen isn't always our best option. In fact, as we'll see later, it's often best to keep these data sets physically separate and then let Excel link them together behind the scenes, so to speak, so we can combine them on demand in analytical reporting. But in cases where you just need to tack some columns from one data set onto another, in the same way that you would with a VLOOKUP, merge queries can be a great option. Okay. Up next, we're going to look at another way of combining multiple data sets that complements merging by allowing us to combine data sets vertically, not horizontally. I'll see you then. Hey, welcome back. So let's wrap up our exploration of Power Query by learning another way to combine separate data sets, appending them. To append data sets means to stack them, so to speak combining their rows vertically and making the data sets taller. This is effectively the inverse of the merge operations we performed in the last video, which made data sets wider by combining their columns. While merging requires that our separate data sets each have a column that we can use to match them to the other data set, row by row, append operations have no such constraint. They do impose a different restriction, however. The data sets we append must have the same number of columns, and these columns should also have consistent data types. In short, the data sets should be structured similarly. They should align. One very common application of append operations is combining chunks of data that have been produced by the same system and pertaining to the same process, but over different time frames. These data sets will all have the same structure the same columns and the same type of data in those columns, but the actual data in the rows of each data set will be different because they pertain to different blocks of time. Say for example that instead of our home sale data set being contained in a single file, it is instead provided to us on a quarterly basis with each file containing sale data for that particular quarter. If we want all that data in one place so we can perform meaningful reporting or analytics on it, we will need to append these files together. And as with so many things, Power Query makes it easy. So here in this folder, we have our home sale data set, the source file that we've been pulling from this entire time, but we also have four quarterly files where the data in our home sale data set has been split out into four pieces by quarter of the year. So our goal here is going to be to combine these pieces back into a whole coherent data set. So back to our Power Query editor. Our first step is going to be to change the connection in our home sale data query to point to the Q1 data file instead of the master home sale data file that has all the data. Now we haven't done this before, but it's actually very straightforward to change the underlying data source of a query in Power Query. So with our home sale data query selected, on the home tab, we'll click this data source settings button. And now we see the data source for each of our three queries. Now we want to change the source for our home sale data query, so we'll select that and then click the change source button. And then, next to the file path for our current source, we'll hit the Browse button. And then, after navigating to the folder that has our Q1 home sale data set, we'll simply select that file and then click Import. And then OK. 
And now if we close out of this window, our data source has been successfully updated. Now you may notice if you look at the bottom left corner of the screen that our data set is still reflecting 161 rows. But if we click this Refresh Preview button on the Home tab, now our data set reflects its updated source. And as you would expect, the number of rows went down because now our source file only has records from the first quarter of the year. Now at this point, we're ready to start creating queries to our additional home sale data sets. To start that process, I'll hit our new source button and then hover over File and then Text CSV. And then I'll select our home sale data Q2 file and click Import and then OK. And then I'll follow the same steps to pull in our Q3 and Q4 data sets. OK, so now that we've created queries to all the different data sets we're going to need to combine together, we're almost ready to begin appending. But first, after going back to my home sale data set, we're actually going to need to time travel back in the list of steps we've applied to this data set to a point before we added or rearranged any columns within that data set. That's because, again, with append operations, it's crucial that all the data sets we're appending to each other have the same number of columns and that those columns align by the type of data stored in them. So if we try to tack on, these raw, untransformed data sets to our original data set that has had a number of derived columns added to it and the order of columns shifted around, our append won't work. So I'll go all the way back to the changed type step, which is the last step that Power Query automatically applied when we imported the original data set. So now we're finally ready to append these data sets together. Now to do that, as you might imagine, we'll hit the Append Queries button on the Home tab of the ribbon. And now Power Query dutifully warns us that by inserting a step before the end of our list of applied steps, we might potentially break something downstream. But we've already thought this through, so we should be good to go. So I'll go ahead and click Insert. And now we have our typical user-friendly Power Query dialog box. We see first that we have the option to append either two tables or three or more tables. Now obviously we're appending three tables into our original, so we'll choose three or more. And then we're given a list of tables available to append on the left, and then the list of tables we're actually appending on the right. And because we had our home sale data set selected, that's been added to our list of tables to append by default. So all we have to do is select our home sale data Q2 through Q4 files on the left and then add them to the list of tables to append on the right. Now we simply do this by clicking to select an individual table on the left and then hitting the add button here to add it to the list of tables to append. But we don't even need to perform this process on each individual file. If you just hold down your control button and then click each one to select, we can now add them all as a group. So we'll click Add, and now we've got all four of the files we're trying to append listed on the right. So we should be good to click OK. And if you look at our row count in the bottom left, you'll see that we now have our original number of rows before we added any filtering transformations later in the process. We see this original unfiltered number of rows because we inserted this step in our list of applied steps before those subsequent transformations. But that's necessary because we want all of these subsequent transformations applied to our appended unified data set. So if I scroll down in my list of applied steps to the very end and then select the last one, we're back to our 161 filtered rows. And then if we scroll to the right, it looks like all of our derived columns are still intact. So I think we can conclude that our append operation was a success. All right, with that, we have wrapped up our little survey of Power Query. Now there's certainly a lot more you can do with it, especially if you're willing to learn the M programming language that underpins Power Query transformations. 
but what you know right now will be more than enough to handle the vast majority of extract, transform, and load data operations that come your way. And that's why we're now going to pivot, for lack of a better word, into the world of Excel's data model, an incredibly powerful feature in Microsoft Excel that allows us to summarize and visualize massive data sets of potentially hundreds of millions of rows spread out across multiple data sets using nothing more exotic than good old-fashioned pivot tables. That's all coming up next. I'll see you then.